Hello viewers, a very good evening. Welcome to our FB live session. And today, as we are having this week celebrated as World Continents Week 2020 from November 16 to 22nd November. So today we are going to discuss on incontinence. And today for our discussion we have with us Dr. Sanjay Sinha sir, who is our senior consultant urologist and transplant surgeon at Apollo Hospitals Hyderabad. Sir has been practicing for the past 25 years and today sir is here with us to share about and to clarify all our doubts about incontinence. Welcome to our live session sir. Hi, thank you. And so sir as we are mentioning that this week is considered as World Continence Week, so please tell our audience about that. So actually urinary incontinence, the phrase implies a problem with controlling urine or leakage of urine. And uh, unfortunately, this problem uh, causes a lot of shame to people and people have not been forthcoming in, uh, uh, in consulting doctors or getting their problems sorted out. So urinary incontinence is a problem which has, which has always been brushed under the carpet. And recognizing the distress that's, that this was causing, the International Continent Society first decided on the idea of, of designating a week in a year as the World Continence Week. And this typically was in the third week of June, but this is an unusual year, a special year. And in this special year, the World Continence Week is being actually celebrated uh, in November. So this is a week which is marked by deliberations across the world to, to uh, uh, bring forth the message about UNAI incontinence, what it is, what can we do about it, and most importantly, the fact that incontinence is treatable. Thank you so much, sir. And sir, let's start off our basic question. So what is incontinence? So as I said, the, the phrase incontinence implies a difficulty in controlling urine. Uh, you know, the ability of human beings to control their urination is something very uh, peculiar or you can say very particular to the characteristics of us being human. Uh, you know, almost no other animal can control their urination, perhaps with the exception of the dog. But otherwise, almost all animals uh, just pass urine wherever they want. So if we have a problem of control, it feels very dehumanizing. So incontinence implies a difficulty in controlling a leakage of urine when it should not happen. Uncontrollable uh, urination problem is what is incontinence. So, what could be the reason behind this? The causes for this problem. Right. So, there are several reasons why uh, incontinence can happen, but uh, uh, two of the important reasons are problems related to the bladder and problems related to the outlet. So, before I elaborate on that, I should tell you a little bit about how the urinary tract is constructed. So the urinary tract is essentially a system designed for purification of the blood. So there's a filtration system which is in the kidneys. So there are two kidneys from which you have a pipe called the ureter which conducts urine to the bladder which is a receptacle deep in our pelvis where urine gets stored. And then every three to four hours when it's appropriate for us is the right time to pass urine, we go to the toilet and empty our bladders. So this is the construction of the, of the urinary tract. Now the bladder holds urine and has two functions, the storage of urine and the passing of urine. So during storage, ordinarily, the bladder pressure is very low, the outlet resistance is very high. Hence, we don't leak urine. So I could lift 50 kilograms of weight right now, and you know Olympic lifters might lift even 200 kilograms of weight and not leak a drop of urine. That's because the control mechanism is very strong. So now you can understand that if there is a leakage, it's either because the control mechanism has got weakened in some measure by, uh, by something, or during storage, the bladder is generating abnormally high pressures. So if there's an imbalance between the bladder storage and in the outlet resistance, you'll get a leak of urine. So sir, and there is one question which a viewer is asking. I think it is about related to incontinence problem that is faced during the pregnancy. Right. So, so you could get the, 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 both these problems actually can manifest in pregnancy. And let me start, start by giving these two problems a name. So the bladder problem, where there is, there is an increase in bladder sensations, there's bladder pressure during storage, that problem is called urgency incontinence, also called as overactive bladder-related problems. 
And the problem where the outlet resistance has got compromised is called stress incontinence. Now you can actually get both of these problems in pregnancy or in a young woman. Uh, during pregnancy, often you get a stress incontinence, especially after the, the period of the de once the delivery has happened actually, because the process of delivery causes a lot of distortion in the pelvic muscular and, and support architecture. And that can actually lead to a disturbance, weakening of the pelvic floor, causing a stress incontinence. Uh, especially women who have who've had multiple childbirths or difficult childbirths are more prone to get stress incontinence later on in life. But you can also get urgency-related uh, incontinence in pregnant women as well as other young women. Sir, there is one common, uh, I don't know whether uh, how to put it across, because many children, you know, right. they don't pass urine in time. They control it, control it, control it up to that extension that because they are playing or they are indulged in something or the other activity, they don't tend to go to the washroom and True. evacuate themselves. Right. So do these children have any further urinary problems like infections right. or something like that or right. land up into this incontinence problem? That's a good question. And most often the peculiar part about this kind of a presentation is most often it's the parents who complain. These children are usually not at all concerned about their, their wetness. And uh, I would say that in a vast majority of such children, there's usually no health problem. It's just that they, these children don't have a strong social desire to remain dry. They are uh, very involved or engrossed in other activities and they don't care about going to the toilet and emptying their bladder and sometimes they just pass wherever they are. Most such children at some point as they grow up, learn that incontinence is something that they want they don't want and at that point this problem actually settles down but a small proportion of children actually have an underlying health problem uh, which can cause incontinence so unlike in many of the adults especially in a child if you are getting daytime incontinence and we are not talking of nighttime bed wetting if you're getting a daytime incontinence in a child it's important to assess because some of these children might be having an underlying bladder function problem which could have implications in terms of their kidney health. Thank you so much sir. And sir, is this incontinence problem is commonly seen in which age group and are mostly seen in men or women? So in fact incontinence can afflict uh, all sections of society, the, both the genders uh, uh, and all age groups. But we know that uh, incontinence is more prevalent in the elderly population and not just more prevalent, when it occurs, it's also more severe in the elderly population. Uh, so in that sense, uh, uh, the elderly individual geriatric population is more prone to get incontinence and between men and women, women usually have more of a problem with incontinence. So the, the symptom of urgency can impact both the genders the same way. But incontinence tends to occur more frequently in women because of the way in which the urinary system is constructed, the length of the urine passage is shorter and the support structures for the urine passage are not as strong. So I would say that the highest risk group, you could say, is elderly women. But then, as I said, you could get incontinence in virtually all age groups and both the genders. So, sir, as uh, you're saying about uh, in elderly population and all, so diabetes people have this problem commonly uh, called as a frequent urination. Is this the same or is this different, sir? Uh, so the answer to that question is a little more complicated than, than it's, uh, it sounds. Uh, so diabetics can have a, a range of impact of, of diabetes on their lower urinary tract. And this, uh, there's an impact in terms of the, the bladder sensations, the bladder muscle power and so on. So often what happens in diabetics is that the bladder sensations are reduced. So you can imagine if I have less sensation from my bladder, I am likely to delay passing urine because I don't get a feeling as if I've got to, my bladder is full. And when that happens over a long period of time, the bladder chronically over distends. And just like a balloon into which you fill too much of air and the balloon loses its shape, if the bladder is over distending chronically, the bladder muscle tends to lose its power. So such individuals with long standing poorly controlled diabetes tend to have a problem where the bladder doesn't empty well now. So the effective capacity comes down. 
So diabetics can actually get urinary frequency urgency for a wide range of problems, starting from the classical overactive bladder kind of problem, urgency, incontinence that I talked about. But the other end of the spectrum is diabetics having a problem of emptying the bladder. And it's like a jug which is full all the time. You add a little bit of water, it overflows by the side. The bladder in such people is full all the time. And as more and more urine is produced from the kidneys and comes to the bladder, it keeps overflowing outside. So it's a chronic retention with overflow incontinence. Thank you so much, sir. And as we were talking about these causes and all, is this a modernized lifestyle that we are having now, is this the major cause for this problem, sir? So I wouldn't really say that the lifestyle is a cause for this problem. So there are some aspects of our lifestyle which do uh, increase the risk. There are perhaps some aspects of our lifestyle which in fact might reduce the risk. Uh, so uh, let's talk about, look at, bo examine both of these. So some of the things that we drink can aggravate our, our urgency and continence. So having a lot of coffee, cola, alcohol, these are things which can actually increase or aggravate the symptoms of incontinence. And that to some extent at least is a lifestyle issue. Uh, many of us are more sedentary now than we used to be or than, than at least our ancestors several generations ago might have been. And we know that pelvic floor muscle strength uh, improves continence. So obviously if there is poor muscle power in the pelvic floor muscles, then we are more likely to have incontinence. But as I said, there's also some aspects of modern day life which protects us. And I think one of the most important things is that the number of children that women have has actually come down. So if you see the mean number or median number of children that uh, uh, are born to a woman, that's been steadily coming down. And we know more number of childbirths is a trigger factor for getting stress incontinence. So there are some factors, they balance each other out, I guess. But we do know that stress incontinence and urgency incontinence are fairly common in society. One uh, other thing that I, I miss telling you about, longevity has gone up. So the number of people above the age of 60 is going to skyrocket compared to what it was, let's say, 10 years ago. Even projections 10, 15 years down the line for India show a dramatic increase in the number of people who are above the age of 60. And that has profound implications for the number of people who are going to present to us with your knee incontinence. So sir, I know uh, incontinence itself means bladder being full always. So how much water do you think that we need to consume? Because nowadays people say that drinking water also drives down all the waste, fats, everything. Right. Right. So we keep on drinking. But right. as doctors say, only 3 liters per day. But some people are there, they just drink enormously. And that they could also land in this problem. So I'm glad you asked that question. Uh, this, this notion that we should drink a large amount of water is in fact prevalent in all societies in some form or the other. So it's not just in India, it's also across Europe and uh, the Western society. So this is a concept that transcends culture. Drink lots of water to, 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 to kind of cleanse the body. Now, to an extent that might be true, we don't want to be dehydrated. But being overhydrated chronically is, is not necessarily a good thing. As they say, too much of anything can be bad. So how do you judge how much to drink? So for most of us, thirst is an excellent guide. So if you follow your thirst, you're unlikely to go wrong because ultimately water is such a basic part of, of life that biology has built in the necessary mechanisms to make sure that we take the adequate and right amount of water. But sometimes we bypass those mechanisms by using our own mind and drinking more or too, too much or too less. So the average 80 kilogram young adult male typically passes about 1.5 liters of urine. And that's your starting point. So your question was, how much should I drink? I'm going to flip that question around and tell you how much you should pass. So we would expect a young adult male to pass about 1.5 liters of urine in 24 hours. Somewhere between 1 to 1.5 liters is the expected urine volume for adults, regardless of their body size. So if it's less than a liter, it's likely you are dehydrated. If it's more than a liter and a half, it's probable that you're drinking more than you need. That does not necessarily mean that it's going to cause you harm, but you're probably drinking more than you need on an earth which is deficient in water, drinking water. Now, how to decide how much to drink? Now, you can imagine if I'm a farmer, or if I'm Roger Federer playing three hours of a five-hour five hour tennis match, I might drink 50 liters to produce my 1.5. But if I'm sitting in an air-conditioned room, I might, might drink one liter and produce 1.5 because even the food that I eat has got water in it, right? 
So the, the answer to your question is, if we are producing urine between 1 and 1.5 liters, and typically that's what's going to satisfy our thirst, then probably we are having the right amount of hydration. In, sorry, uh, in some groups, we might want to tell them to increase their water intake. So those are some special situations. Somebody who has a background of stone disease, we may tell them to target a urine volume of 2 liters or 2.5 liters in 24 hours. But for the average person, 1.5 liters should be good enough. Right. Thank you so much, sir. And so some people might be having a feeling of as if they are going to have urine. Right. But once they reach the washroom, they might not pass the urine. Even that is a one type of symptom or a cause for the same thing? Or is it right. So, so in fact, the symptom of urgency, which is what you are alluding to in, in certain ways, is a very complex symptom. Uh, so let me give you a small example to illustrate this. There is something called key in the lock syndrome. That means I have a problem of urgency and I'm able to control my urine until I reach the front door of my house, take the key out of my pocket and start opening the door. And at that point, I get such a strong desire that I just cannot hold and I flood my clothes with leakage. Now the interesting thing is, if instead of taking a 10 minute bus ride, I take a one hour ride and reach home, the same problem happens at the end of one hour instead of 10 minutes. So clearly it's not just the bladder at fault. There's a cortical influence from our brains which is interacting with the bladder. And we've experienced this all the time. You might be remembering just before an examination, you want to go and pass urine three times. You've got an interview coming up, you feel you've got to go and pass urine. There's a strong connect between the bladder and the, and the brain which we are only now beginning to decipher because we never had good tools to study this. But over the last 10, 15 years now, functional MRI imaging is giving us a wealth of data now regarding where are the, which regions of the brain are involved in, in these aspects of bladder function, what is the implication of this. Right now we have no therapeutics which are based on this. But I can envisage that somewhere down the line we will probably have therapeutics which target not the bladder but actually target the brain uh, to tackle the problem of urgency. So you could get urgency, reach the toilet and find that the urge subsides. Uh, that is known to happen, yes. Thank you, sir. And sir, as we were talking about the causes of this incontinence. So how do we prevent this problem, sir? It's just only through medications and treatment. Is there something else that we can do at homes? Right. So there are several lifestyle interventions which can help and some of them I actually gave a passing reference to. So you don't, you, you want adequate but not excessive fluid intake. The quality of fluids that we are having. So you don't want somebody who's got a bladder problem to drink large amounts of tea or coffee or alcohol or colas. Uh, the reason for this is that these particular liquid substances have additional chemicals in them which, which take more than their share of water out with them. So they, they are what we call diuretic property uh, liquids. So if you drink three cups of coffee, strong coffee especially, you're likely to have a lot of diuresis. It worsens the symptoms. That's the other thing. Now, uh, the, uh, weight control can help. So people who are obese, if they can reduce their weight by about as less as 5%, uh, there's a clear impact on, on all forms of urinary incontinence. So that can help. So moderating fluid intake, looking at the quality of fluids that we are uh, uh, consuming, tackling constipation. There's a link between a full rectum and bladder symptoms. So people who have chronic constipation tend to have aggravation of urinary symptoms. And treating the constipation tends to improve the urinary symptoms even if you don't specifically treat the urine symptoms. So these are some general measures which can help us uh, in improving urinary incontinence uh, related symptoms. Other than this, there are two more things one can do at home. Uh, one is pelvic floor muscle training and the other is bladder training. And um, uh, I can perhaps, uh, if we have a little time, just elaborate a little on these two things. Pelvic floor muscle training is a technique to improve the strength, endurance, and contraction power of the pelvic floor muscle. Just like any other muscle, if I've got to improve the strength of my biceps, I exercise, weight train, and so on. Similarly, you need to exercise the pelvic floor muscle to improve its strength. But the problem here is that almost 50% of, of people cannot identify the right set of muscles as the pelvic floor. So if you give them an instruction that you do this, 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 one, two, three, blah, 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 they contract the wrong set of muscles. And this is nothing to do with education or literacy. 
It's just that we are not able to identify the pelvic floor muscles correctly. And this is across society again, uh, different cultures. So if you really want to learn pelvic floor muscle training, somebody has to teach you first. But once you have been taught pelvic floor muscle training, then you can continue it at the house. So that's one thing that you can do. And doing 10 sets of exercises in the morning, noon, night is typically what we recommend people. And the, you, uh, these exercises can be done while doing household work, watching television or whatever you're doing. So that's one extra specific measure you can take at home. The second specific measure you can take at home is what is called bladder training. Now bladder training is a system by which we recondition the mind and the bladder so that the person is able to delay the urge by incremental amounts. So we start with small modest targets trying to delay the urge by 10 minutes each time in a week and then going up after a week another 10 minutes till we are able to reach a socially acceptable interval between two urine passages. And this is done by looking at what's called the bladder diary and teaching urge inhibition techniques. So there are certain techniques which can help us inhibit the urge or urgency. So we give a kind of a drill to the patient and they use the bladder diary which is a record of the time at which they have passed here in the volume passed each time and so on. They use that as a reference point and do the bladder drill to increase the intervoir interval till it becomes socially acceptable. So these are some things short of medication or, or invasive procedures which can help with humane incontinence. So sir, as you were mentioning some procedures or not, through medications, can we control this problem? Right. So as I told you in the beginning, there are two different forms of, in, mainly two different forms of incontinence, the urgency incontinence and the stress incontinence. Now urgency incontinence, if it's not responded to conservative measures, can often, very often be managed by medication. And we have two different classes of medication. We have the anti-muscarinic medicines and we have the beta-3 adrenergic agonist medicines. A big mouthful both, isn't it? But these are, these are medicines which are, which are now easily available. They are reasonably cost effective. And these two medicines, types of medicines, work by, from different mechanisms. So because they have different mechanisms of action, we also have the potential to combine them to increase or enhance or potentiate their efficacy. So these medicines can help in controlling urgency incontinence, but they work typically only as long as you use the tablet. So once you stop the medicine, just like somebody with hypertension, the effect of the medicine goes away. But if the person has also been taught all the other things I spoke about in the last 10 minutes, those things can stay with the person for life. So it's possible to start medication, start all the other measures, and then at some point we might be able to withdraw the medicines and still the person might remain comfortable because they have learned some of the other things that we taught which can help with urine control. This is for the urgency incontinence. For the stress incontinence, unfortunately, we don't have good medication. So there, are, there is one medicine which is approved in certain markets um, for use for stress incontinence, but it's essentially an antidepressant drug used in a very high dose, and there are certain uh, concerns in the usage of that drug. So by and large, if somebody has significant stress incontinence, not responsive to conservative management, typically they need to move on to a surgical procedure. But for urgency incontinence, which is a very common form of incontinence affecting almost 10, 15 percent of society, it should be possible to manage that with medication in a large proportion of patients. So sir, as you were mentioning about medication, surgeries or any simple procedures, can this problem be solved completely? Right. So uh, as I again said, they, uh, we'll go back to those two different classes of incontinence because their, their invasive treatments differ. So if somebody has an urgency incontinence, remember urgency incontinence, the culprit was the bladder. In stress incontinence, the culprit was the outlet. So for urgency incontinence where the bladder is the culprit, if tablets are not working, then we have two invasive procedures which can help. One, injection of botulinum toxin into the bladder wall. And second, sacral neuromodulation or some other forms of neuromodulation techniques uh, which can be used to modulate the spine, spinal cord nerve impulses. So let me tell you very briefly first about botulinum toxin. So botulinum toxin injection is a relatively simple procedure. It takes maybe 15 or 20 minutes. It can be done on a daycare basis and the person goes home immediately. It takes about a week or so for the effect of the injection to come. It's injected into the bladder wall directly at cystoscopy in the operating room. The effect comes in about a week or so and lasts for about eight or nine months. 
So it lasts for about 6 to 12 months after which the effect gradually wears off. And then if the patient is again having significant symptoms, you need to re-inject. But it doesn't seem to lose its efficacy over a period of time if you re-inject. So many of my patients typically are able to manage with once in a year injection. But before I proceed any further, I must tell you a small story about botulinum toxin. So botulinum toxin was a substance that I got introduced to in my school as a high school child. And um, uh, some of you of my generation might remember an author, Alistair MacLean, who used to write uh, novels. And Alistair MacLean novels were very, very popular when I was in high school. And one of his novels was The Satan Bug. The name of the, the novel was The Satan Bug. And I remember it was my, my favorite Alistair MacLean novel when I think I must have been in class 10th or class 11th. This novel was based on botulinum toxin. And that's the first time that I learned about botulinum toxin. Botulinum toxin is produced by a bacterium. Forget which bacteria is produced by a bacterium. It's the most deadly poison known to mankind. Most deadly poison. One teaspoon of botulinum toxin can wipe out the entire human race. It's that poisonous. But like any other deadly poison, used in the right dilution, it becomes a powerful medicine. So botulinum toxin in a very, very dilute form is now used to calm muscles down. And it can be ejected into the bladder wall to calm the bladder down. It can be injected into skeletal muscles in spastic children to reduce spasticity. It's used by women injections into the face to reduce their wrinkles. So it has been used across a wide range of indications uh, in the human body. And so injecting botulinum into the bladder can calm the bladder down. And almost 70 to 75 percent of people who have not responded to other measures will respond to the injection. The other technique is neuromodulation. And that can be done typically the severe cases we do what's called sacral neuromodulation. So this is an implant which we put into the S3 sacral spinal space. Uh, this implant is interiorized, internalized into the body and typically works for about five years or so. Is very expensive at this point of time but nevertheless is an effective method of management. Again about 60 to 70 percent of people who have not responded to anything tend to respond and there are certain advantages to neuromodulation in patients who have got bladder muscle weakness uh, and or constipation because neuromodulation can have some beneficial impact on certain other aspects of pelvic floor problems which botulinum doesn't solve. But otherwise both treatments are very effective. Botulinum is much simpler, easier and cheaper to, uh, to do. For stress incontinence, you have a surgical procedure. And that is minimally invasive surgeries are there or con conventional surgical options are there for treating stress incontinence. So if stress incontinence has not responded to pelvic floor muscle training, lifestyle changes, then a surgical option needs to be considered. And those surgical options typically can or usually are designed to give long-term, long-lasting relief in the symptom. Thank you, sir. And sir, we have a question from an audience. Dear doctor, is there any connection between liver disease and incontinence? So I'm not aware of a direct connection between liver disease and incontinence. But liver disease has a profound impact on, on our health, uh, right from uh, deterioration in our nutritional status. De deterioration in nutritional status causes problems with, with muscle strength. Uh, we also know that liver disease causes changes in the hormonal milieu of the body. So it's a, it has a wide range of impact on the human body. And incontinence could potentially occur for a wide range of reasons. Uh, but there is no direct link to my, to my knowledge between having a liver disease and developing incontinence. But indirect mechanisms, there are several mechanisms one can, one can potentially think of. But clearly somebody with liver disease or advanced liver disease has many other things on their mind, uh, not just you know, incontinence. So the impact of diet is twofold. One is the chronic impact of a diet which is unhealthy. So over a period of time, if you consume diets which are imbalanced and you gain a lot of weight, then we know that obesity has a link with incontinence. So that's one way in which diet can be linked. The other way in which diet can be linked is that some individuals have what are called trigger foods. So there are certain food substances which tend to trigger symptoms in those individuals. Now, there's, you don't have one universal trigger food for everybody. But there are some individuals in whom certain spicy food, for instance, can trigger. There are some people in whom cheese can trigger it. So there are individuals who recognize 
over a period of time that, okay, when I have this particular substance, I get into trouble. Some of the other things I already mentioned like coffee and tea, but these we are talking of food substances and there are trigger foods and if somebody is able to identify a particular trigger food, the clear solution for that individual is to avoid that trigger food. So what happens if incontinence is left untreated? Right. Okay, so uh, let's look at this from two different perspectives. One is the perspective of incontinence not being diagnosed adequately and left untreated. So somebody has urinary incontinence. I told you that in a, in a vast majority of people, it's not really a health hazard. And this is something that I didn't really discuss in detail earlier, so I must do it now. So for most people, incontinence is not a health hazard. It's typically a quality of life problem. But for a small subset of people, incontinence can be the manifestation of an underlying bladder function problem which can be hazardous. So take for example the in, an individual who has had a spinal injury, somebody with neurological problems, somebody with multiple sclerosis, somebody with certain forms of Parkinson related disease. Some of these individuals will have abnormal pressures in the bladder. And these abnormal pressures can reflect up to the kidney, cause a swelling in the kidneys and deterioration in kidney function. So some forms of incontinence can, have a, can be associated with problems with kidney function and can be hazardous. And typically those tend to present differently, but if somebody has those forms of incontinence, it's exceedingly important to reach the doctor in time. We have children who are born with spine abnormalities in whom just two years delay that means they've been born and the parents have come at two years age has been enough that the child is already in kidney failure which is irreversible. So for certain diagnoses immediate assessment is very important but for the vast majority not treating incontinence will give rise primarily to an emotional burden. The impact of incontinence on emotional uh, status on quality of life on depression is huge. Uh, such people tend to get withdrawn from society, they stop meeting people, that has consequences for them. Sometimes elderly individuals with strong sense of urgency might need to run to the toilet. They've already got a, a osteoarthritis of the knee and they may trip and fall. The fall causes a fracture and the fracture becomes a terminal event in their life. So it, there are so many different consequences such that the, the, the cost of incontinence management as a holistic cost is in fact equivalent or higher than the cost of many other important health diseases like oncological treatment and, and cardiovascular disease matches that kind of cost internationally because there is so much of consequential cost in terms of incontinence management. Thank you so much sir and I think we have covered mostly all the aspects of incontinence if at all I have left anything asking you please I, 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 think, I think you did an excellent job, Harita, and I must thank you for, for that. Um, uh, so uh, we have covered most of the, of the things that I wanted to. I think if uh, there's any message that I would like to leave you with uh, uh, today, it would be this. Incontinence is common in society. The odds are that if you were to ask around in your own household, you will probably find that one out of one individual in your house is probably having some element of incontinence in your own household if you ask them, but they are embarrassed to talk about it. So it's important to talk about incontinence. There's nothing to be ashamed of. If you talk about it, bring it into the open, then only the first step to finding a solution happens. And it is almost invariably possible to find a solution. And in most individuals, it's a quality of life problem. Sometimes we may be able to assess and reassure the patient that there's no health hazard and the patient may elect not to do anything about it, which is, which is perfectly fine. But as I said, in a small subset of people, it might represent a, a, a serious diagnosis. So if there is at all some unexpected uh, incontinence, it's not a part of aging. You should not consider it a natural part of aging. It's important to get this checked. And then one can take an informed decision whether one would like to do anything about it. Thank you so much, sir. And Thank uh, you. dear audience, I hope all your doubts have been clarified. And if at all still you have any other doubts left, you can leave them in the comment session or you can write us an email at apollohealthcity at apollohospitals.com. We will get back to you shortly. And you can even book an appointment with Dr. Sanjay Sina, sir. The link has been given in the text box. On just one click, you can book an appointment. And at Apollo Hospitals, we are practicing strict measures to ensure that you are entering a COVID safe zone. All our staff are wearing masks 
and we are maintaining the social distancing and sanitizing our floors, our desks and even our hands regularly. And for this session itself, doctor is using here without mask as, uh, as there will be a voice disturbance. So that is why doctor is not wearing a mask. It doesn't show that that sir is not wearing a mask. So I must, I, before I, you close, Harita, I must, I must actually, uh, I'm glad you brought about this subject because the, it's the elephant in the room. Yes. We should not have any health discussion in 2020 without talking about the, the ongoing pandemic of COVID-19. Uh, you might be seeing the mark on my nose which shows that I had a tight fitting N95 right up to the moment before this interview happened and I was wearing a shield. The mask that you wear is to protect others from you. The shield that you wear protects you from others. A combination of a shield and a mask makes sure that you are protected and people whom you love, people who are around you are protected. The, the measures to prevent COVID-19 are very simple. You just need to wash your hands Avoid touching your face without washing your hands. Maintain a distance of six feet, ideally, six feet from each other. Do not essentially come, as, especially with, uh, at less than three feet, unless it's absolutely essential, and wear a mask and a shield. If you do that, it's, it's absolutely possible to prevent COVID-19. There's a fatigue setting in. And that fatigue along of COVID-19 being around for so many months, along with the fact that it's becoming winter, especially in the northern Indian states, for instance, in some certain parts of the country, it gets very cold, people are huddled indoors. All this actually makes the virus more, more lethal. So it's very important. Don't get fatigued. Practice all the precautions. Relief is around the corner. Relief in the form of vaccines, better therapeutics are around the corner, but it will take time. We are 1.3 billion people in, in our country and 7.5 and billion on Earth. It's going to take time to reach everybody. Until that time, you've got to be patient. Just a few months of patience can, can give you a, 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 a continued healthy life. But just one moment of, of your impatience or one moment of dropping your guard is enough to cause a disaster. So stay safe, everybody, and practice all your precautions. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, sir, and thank you to your audience for tuning in. Stay tuned for more such awareness FB live sessions.